absolutely delighted to be here talking about museums in a museum. I'm just looking over there because we had that exact television when I was growing up, so that's like, quite exciting for me. So, my first experience with museum theatre was at Grade 4 camp at Sovereign Hill. This is a gold rush town, so I'm going to say, hands up if you've been to Sovereign Hill. 95% of you, fantastic. Now, who's been on school camp to Sovereign Hill? Maybe like 5%? That's good, that's fine. Um, so, in a nutshell, if you haven't been to Sovereign Hill or you haven't had the excitement of a school camp, Sovereign Hill is an open air living history museum that captures the gold rush in the 1850s in Victoria. And this is where my school, my, school, my class, my grade four class, turned up in the bus. <clears throat> and once we arrived, we were given historical costumes and led to a school building. From the moment we arrived, the modern world, well, 1989, didn't exist. It was no longer referenced. We were in this amazing, immersive experience where we had to write with nibbed pens and we played knuckles at recess and we learned our 13 times table and it was so immersive and I felt it was a very special moment and I was hooked. So what, about, what was it about this experience that actually led me to spend many years, I think something conservative estimate, I think I was at university for about 13 years, something like that, um, studying museum theatre, so researching it, looking at case studies from all over the world, and also becoming a performer myself. What was it about it? To, to understand that question, we kind of have to go back to the museum. So my topic today is the transformative power of museum theatre. You may not have come across this particular term before, but you can probably guess what it is, museum and theatre. It's using performative techniques in cultural institutions. So that's not just museums, that's also the aquarium, uh, um, science exhibits, uh, art galleries, cultural institutions in general, places like this, any kind of heritage site, um, to try and create connections between the visitors and the stories and the objects and the themes and the research. So museum theatre is about provoking. <coughs> It's about creating points of meaningful connection. It's about aiding recall. And it's about, well, it's effectively enhancing the reasons that we go to the museum. We go to the museum to see ourselves. Stories of humanity are played out across architecture, art, technology, agriculture, all of those things. We go to the museum to see transformation evolution of humans, the transfiguration of the world, the earth, from a molten rock lava flaming ball into the habitable planet that we enjoy today. We go to the museum because the future is not a done deal. Climate change, pandemics, international conflict. We go to the museum to catch a glimpse of our future scientific discoveries, technology. But do we go to the museum to see theatre? Put up your hand if you've gone to the museum specifically to see theatre. One, two people. Fantastic, that's, that's probably better than average. Do we go to the museum to see theatre? Well, we used to. Museum theatre isn't actually a new initiative or term. If I was going to lay out the genealogy or the family tree of museum theatre, it would have lots of cousins and parents and aunts and uncles, and they would be called living history, historical reenactment, theatre in education. And if I go back even further to the American Dime Museum of the late 1800s and then early 20th century, it was actually very common to go to the museum to see performances. Because it was more respectable to go to the museum theatre than it was to go to the regular theatre. Museums were open late and it was a wholesome family entertainment. So the idea is that people, the whole family could go to see a lovely play and it was an alternative to the pub, which was the other thing that was open late. Now, in terms of the types of performances that you would see there, they were generally morality plays. I can feel this think, um, hooking into some of the themes that have already been discussed today. But the, the plays were usually about drunkenness or domestic violence. 
So the idea was that in coming to see a play, um, it was to take audiences on an emotive journey to re-establish and reaffirm their moral framework. So by the time they came out, they were heavily reminded, don't beat your wife. Don't drink to the point where you are uh, exhibiting social, uh, antisocial behaviours. We go to the museum to see our ancestors. We go to the museum to see both the best and the worst of humanity. Elizabeth Pickard, who's one of my colleagues in museum theatre in the United States, developed an amazing program called Teens Make History with the local, um, the Missouri Historical Society. And the idea was they took secondary students from local schools and they paid them. They, they had paid apprenticeships where they came to the museum and their job was to research and perform museum theatre relating to the specific exhibits. And they worked together with the museums to identify things that would resonate with the local community. One group were really drawn to an exhibit about the local diner sit-ins of the 1940s. If you're not familiar with that, uh, you have to cast yourself back to 1940s in America, where racial segregation was very heavily still practiced. And African American people were not permitted to come and sit down in a diner or in the, in the whites only section of a diner or a whites only diner and be served due to their race. So they developed a non-violent strategy where they would come into the diner and sit at the counter. And they would be refused service because of their race, but they would continue to sit. They would not leave. These protests carried on for the next two decades. So the students were very attracted to this topic and there was actually already an exhibit in the museum where it had a diner. So it was like a, a stage set, already ready to go, ready for performers and actors to come in to recreate these moments. Now, there were three moments of transformation here. The first one was probably when the students started researching the topic and the enormity of the discrimination they experienced and it would have been very startling to really recall that only some of the cast would have been allowed to go in and sit down at that diner. Maybe the second point of transformation would have been from the audience because they were listening to this story with an empathy that you don't really get from curatorial labels. But maybe the third moment of transformation was actually when the audience at the conclusion of the performance stepped over that line, because it's not a stage like this, you're just in the museum space, and began to talk to them. I was there, my grandparents were there, I remember that, it all happened here. That really strong connection. So we go to the museum to see our past selves. And it goes without saying that museum theatre like this promotes connection and conversation. We go to the museum to get knowledge and also potentially shift our worldview if we get new information. Like theatre, museum theatre doesn't just dispense facts. It's the opposite of curatorial labels. So curators have to be very clever because they have to provide information and also interest using an economy of words. But museum theatre takes you on a journey. Understanding happens somewhere between point A and point B. An example was given by one of my colleagues who runs a museum theatre company in South Australia called Heaps Good Productions. And the naming of place is a highly contested aspect of, of Australian history. And it's an important thing to raise within the safe confines of a museum because Australia was only recently colonised. It's only been a few hundred years. And part of that colonisation was a massive impact on the First Peoples, including uh, destruction of language and traditional life, and also the changing of place names. So in this play, uh, there's some explorers on a boat, and they're really excited because they're seeing all these new things <laughs> are on their way around Australia. And they, um, they were really excited about naming things, giving new names to things. And then this seagull character comes up to them, and you know, a talking seagull, it's theatre, it's allowed, and says, wait, these places already have names. 
Now, this is a very strong <coughs> message. Um, it's actually really good that a seagull delivers it because I think it's a good way, it makes it more palatable, it's not lecturing or preaching. It's also a way you can connect with audiences from pri primary right until adults and you're still getting the same, so the same general notion. And also there's something quite nice about an animal delivering important information. Um, perhaps you, if you cast back through your own childhood, you'll realise that many of your moral frameworks were actually delivered by animal mascots. If you grew up in Victoria, you might remember Harold the giraffe from the Life Education Caravan. Harold used to come along and he would uh, tell us, you know, eat healthily, exercise, say no to cigarettes, and don't bully your classmates. So that's great. We were able to form a very strong moral framework based on Harold. And now he gives instruction on not vaping and cyberbullying. <laughs> These were not pressing matters in the 1990s. We go to the museum to be surprised. Museum theatre can add nuance to some of the most, well, some of the strongest canons. Every time I see a fashion corset, in museums across the world, I like to loiter and eavesdrop and take notes because I like to see people responding to this garment. And it's usually the same sort of things. Oh my goodness, I remember my grandmother wearing one of those. Oh, if you tried one on, they're so uncomfortable, you couldn't breathe. So all of these conversations are generally the same. And it was a wonderful piece of museum theatre created for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And I, like most people, knew about the issues of corsets, so the digestive issues, the not breathing, the fainting couches required, the restrooms, we literally had to go and rest because you couldn't breathe. Um, but they also introduced some other aspects to it. And one of them was that women actually did this for themselves. And that really didn't click to me until I imagined a museum in the future where everyone's standing around looking at stilettos and going, did women, women really wear those? Why did they do that to themselves? What about the sprained ankles and the bunions and the um, plantar fasciasis? Um, so sometimes we need to disrupt the narrative. A museum theatre gives us the space to create perspectives, but also just um, juxtapose the present and the past. My final example, we go to the museum to engage with hard histories. We go to the museum to see how far we've come. 15 years ago, I was in the United States conducting postgraduate research on museum theatre. And I was lucky enough to spend a few days at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. And they had a wonderful exhibition there. If you're lucky enough to go to this museum, museum theatre is centre stage. It is created alongside the exhibits. This is an exhibition for children because performance is a language that anyone can understand, even if you're pre-literate. So, the Power of Children exhibition celebrated extraordinary people. One of them was Anne Frank, one was Ruby Bridges, who was the first African-American girl um, to go to a, um, a, a school, a white school, um, during the Civil Rights Movement, and very, very, very powerful story there. And the other story was Ryan White. Now, Ryan White was a young American boy who was diagnosed, where well, he contracted AIDS as a result of a blood transfusion in the 1980s. At the time, the disease wasn't well known and he faced a lot of discrimination. And amongst other things, he was actually barred from going to school. So as part of the performance, the actor plays Ryan White with the permission of his family. Ryan had passed in the 1990s. Um, in front of an exhibit which recreated Ryan's real bedroom using everything from his bedroom. And he performed a piece about what it was like to have AIDS and what it was like to suffer the discrimination, but also the fact that he, he moved past that and became a sort of celebrity. He had you know, amazing letters from celebrities who wrote to him and he was able to kind of change that narrative. This was an incredibly challenging theme. And you think, it's Children's Museum? But it was so successful in the way it was performed and the way it delivered such an important topic. To conclude, I hope I've made you a little bit curious about museum theatre, and I hope that you want to find out more. Cultural institutions are full of things that make us reflect on how human beings have changed and grown over time. 
how they interact with the natural world, and how to chart a possible trajectory for the future. Theatres are places where we're no longer bound by reality, but most plays choose to focus on the human condition. When combined, the fields of, fields of museology and performance, well, together, they create a formidable impact on how we frame world history or social issues. Used correctly, museum theatre is a powerful tool for challenging perceptions, provoke, provoking emotional responses, aiding recollection, introducing counter-narratives, facilitating enduring understanding, and sometimes disrupting the stories that we tell ourselves about the past. Thank you.